16th, welcome to our Ag Tech Professional Forum. Also, we're talking about plant health again this year. We had a couple of events coming up that I want to make sure everybody is aware of. So we have September 21st and 24th, the Bio Impact Ag and Environment Conference. It is listed on our website if you would like some more information. Unfortunately, it was supposed to be held here in Raleigh, but at these times, we are uh, going to have to keep it virtual. October 13th and 15th, we have the Ag Chem Summit 2020. You can go to the agrochemicalsummit.com for more information and registration. Our next event, our next professional forum will be on November 11th. We are finalizing details right now, so keep a lookout and we'll have new details posted soon. And then on November 16th, we have our next Animal Health and Nutrition Exchange Group. And again, those details will be posted shortly as well. So I would like to take this moment to introduce Fate Thompson, who is one of our annual sponsors here representing Global Ag and iAdvantage Software. And he will be giving you an overview of the program today and getting an introduction to the panelist and moderator. Fate. Thank you, Michelle. And a good virtual afternoon to all of you. I'm Faye Thompson. I'm president of Global Agricultural Development Corporation. Global Ag is an agricultural product development company. We partner with ag technology companies to help them bring their technology from proof of concept to the development process. For several years, Smith Anderson, Myers, and Beagle and HPG have been annual sponsors of this Ag Tech Professional Forum. This year, Global Ag is delighted to join them. I would also like to rec also recognize the forum's supporting sponsor, Alexandria Launch Labs Ag Tech. This Ag Tech Professional Forum meets five times a year. The knowledge sharing and networking among academic industry allied services professionals. As mentioned earlier, this year, the Ag Tech Professional Forum is joining the effort of the United Nations General Assembly to, in recognizing 2020 as the International Year of Plant Health. Thus, this forum series this year is dedicated to raising global awareness of the importance of protecting plant health in reducing hunger and poverty, in protecting the environment, and in boosting economic development. Today's program is a panel discussion on using technology to monitor, analyze, and treat to foster plant health. It is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Chris Reberg Horton, who will be the moderator of this panel. Dr. Reberg Horton, who hails from Fairview, a small mountain community in Western North Carolina, is a professor at North Carolina State University. He received a BS in Environmental Sciences from UNC, a master's from UC Davis in crop modeling, and later a PhD from NC State in agronomy. Early in his career, as an assistant professor of sustainable agriculture with the University of Maine, he worked with organic dairy farmers in grain and forage production. Currently, as a full professor, Dr. Reber Horton coordinates an on-farm research network of 16, in 16 states that provides continuous data feedback to farmers and researchers. He is the SAR Professional Development Coordinator for NC State. That acronym is S-A-R-E, standing for Sustainable Agricultural Research and Education, for those of you who didn't recognize it like I didn't initially. Lastly, he is Assistant Director of Collaborative Research at the Center for Environmental Farming Systems. Dr. Reber Horton's work, his work in precision sustainable agriculture makes him an ideal moderator for this panel. Chris, it's virtually all yours. Thank you so much. Thank you everyone for joining us here today. 
Um, IoT, artificial intelligence, cloud-based platforms, UAVs, autonomous data collection. These are the buzzwords being discussed in every industry today, including agriculture. Will these new technologies really revolutionize agriculture as promised? And if so, what does that future look like? Unlike a smart factory, our production floor is full of biological complexity with pests, weather, and crops interacting rapidly with each other. Not only is it a complex environment, it is a harsh one. Sensing platforms must be rugged and wireless networks must cover a much larger area with many obstacles. These factors combined are why agriculture is one of the least digitized sectors of the economy. So enough of the bad news. The good news is these obstacles are being overcome and we are here today with a panel of experts to discuss how they are being overcome and where we are headed. In addition to providing examples from their own work, they are here to respond to your questions on the future of technology and agriculture. So let's get started with some introductions. First up, Andrew Nelson, farmer and passionate software engineer. Hi, thanks, Chris. I'm Andrew Nelson. I farm in Washington State on the eastern side where it's dry land farming. I also work a lot with Microsoft and their Farm Beats program. So I integrate everything that Farm Beats does on our farm. Uh, that means that I combine my farming and software engineering a lot um, and sometimes some mechanical and electrical engineering <laughs> when needed. Um, implementing sensors around my farm, uh, TV white space in the narrow and wide band, so that way I can get connectivity further out. Uh, and then I use drone mapping, uh, drone spraying, and uh, try to integrate all of those together to get kind of a more holistic view of my farm and to start getting better feedback loops for applying uh, my pesticides or fertilizers um, on my field in a much more granular approach. Great, thank you, Andrew. Uh, next up, Ron Heinegger, professor and corn specialist for NCSU, stationed at the Vernon James Research Center in Eastern North Carolina. Thanks, Chris, it's good to be with you. Yeah, I'm a, a, a professor of crop science indeed. One of the things that uh, I, I do is applied research, and my focus on applied research over the last 26 years has been to try to integrate technologies uh, into that. For instance, currently we're looking at using UAVs to actually measure when a plant emerges from the ground. Uh, my career started back with crop modeling coming out of graduate school. I was the one that early uh, uh, members of the Precision Ag Group, uh, what we called site-specific management back in the 90s uh, there, grew into Precision Ag. In fact, uh, I, could, I got my own Al Gore story. I can, I can say that I'm actually the one who invented the term Precision Ag. So if you believe that, why well, I, I got some uh, bridges to sell you. But at any rate, that just shows you that uh, I've had a long history in this, including things like soil conductivity, site uh, grid management, yield monitors, uh, looking at early imaging to try to determine plant health and, and uh, uh, growth characteristics, and now, of course, moving toward UAVs and other sensor technologies uh, as they come available. It's, it's been a long journey, but it's also been a rewarding one, and I can't hardly wait to see what is coming down the road. Great, thanks, Ron. Next up, Ralph Dean, William Neal Reynolds, Distinguished Professor in Plant Pathology. We've got you muted, Ralph, sorry. We good? There we go. Thanks, Chris, and good afternoon to everybody. It's a real pleasure to be here, and hopefully we can have an interesting discussion and answer some of your questions. Um, as Chris mentioned, I am a professor in the Department of Entomology and Plant Pathology here at NC State. Um, I originally trained as a, a plant biochemist and I've been interested in the role of, and function of metabolic pathways. 
And this has led me to my current interest, which is it really is the development of the next generation of sensor technologies. And so I will hopefully get to talk a little bit about that today through some of the questions. Um, I've spent 30 years of my career um, studying how plants and, and, and pests and pathogens, how do they communicate with one another? Disease outcome is through that type of communication, both from the point of view this this communication is, in other words, is how do plants and, and microbes talk to one another? In particular, how do pathogens perceive and infect host plants? And conversely, how do, path, how do plants recognize a pathogen and defend themselves? And I've used lots of different technologies and techniques to, to look at this from biochemistry to molecular genomics to answer these questions. But the bottom line is that it's through, through mo molecules, specific chemicals, um, and their interactions which determine how things work out, whether it's disease or whether it's resistance. So we can think of these molecules as words. And so plants and their pathogens and pests, they communicate with each other through a language. Okay, and, and my interest in these different, uh, this language is composed of these different chemicals, these different molecules. So this is the language of plant defense. So what is the language of plant defense? So my interest in recent years, and this is leading now to the next generation, hopefully of, of sensors, um, has focused on how can we decode this language and how can we use this information once we've decoded it to protect plants from destructive pathogens. And so uh, to, to work on this, I've worked with in the last few years with different electrical engineers and different companies, et cetera, to develop new sensitive and inexpensive listening technology. So we can actually listen in on the secret lives of how plants and microbes communicate. The whole purpose of this is so that we can get an early detection system for disease. And the goal is over the next few years is how can we then eventually deploy these new types of technologies in the field. So that's a nutshell of where we are. Great, thank you so much, Ralph. Um, you muted. Chris, you were muted, but you're now unmuted. Oh, I'm sorry. Thought you were talking to Doug. I apologize. Thank you, Ralph. Um, Next up, uh, we have Doug Farrington, Regional Digital Officer for BASF, uh, located right here in the Triangle. Yeah, hi, Chris, thank you. And thanks to my colleagues here and for, uh, for everybody on the, uh, on the call today. Uh, really appreciate the, the opportunity to be here. I, um, I grew up, the first, first picture of me is sitting on the lap of my grandfather on a John Deere tractor. Um, I grew up farming in central Illinois in a little town, ironically called Farmersville. Some of you may know it. Um, and went on to uh, do a number of things in my career since then, uh, in and out of the ag industry and ran a software company for 10 years in cancer research, uh, which interestingly enough has a lot of uh, interesting parallels uh, to the work we're doing in, in plant science. Um, I joined Syngenta in 2013 after spending some, some time in a couple of other industries related to agriculture and then joined BASF a couple of years ago and I would have a, a BASF shirt or hat on. The only thing I have that says BASF is a face mask which I was hoping I didn't have to wear today for a change. So uh, I'm glad to be here. You know, we've got a lot of things going on at BASF in the digital realm uh, related to plant health uh, and, and other technologies, sensor technologies, and uh, really excited to be a part of this and, and uh, try to answer some questions if I can and uh, hopefully learn some things as well. So thank you. Great. Thank you, Doug. All right. I want to kick us off with a, a first question here. Um, where is the low hanging fruit right now? Meaning where's the, what tech do you think will be changing how we manage these fields just in the next five years or so? I think that one's for me, the field. <laughs> um, so 
the way that I've been using tech on my farm and uh, and the way that I've been integrating it, I think kind of speaks to an easy way and an easier route for people to start being able to implement more of these uh, technologies together. Um, I think that's kind of one of the main things is being able to connect and have feedback loops on the data that we are currently able to connect to. So you can have sensors in a field, you can have a drone flight or satellite imagery on it. You can then combine that information to be able to make better insights and make better management decisions. So that's kind of one of the main ways where I see ag tech going is all these different parts that we have on our farm. Uh, we're able to combine them together and get a better holistic view of our farm. So right now, even I'm able to do a drone flight of my field, identify where there's uh, grassy weed issues, and I'm able to send my drone sprayer and spray just those areas where there's a grassy weed issue. So I'm taking a spray that I used to broadcast over the whole field. Let's say it's a 200 acre field. I'm able to cut that down to 18 to 25 acres I actually have to spray in it um, and that's one of the things I think that we're going to get better and better at is being able to take those scenarios and have the, the feedback loop coming to farmers much much faster and I think that's going to really help us um, in improving yields and making us more sustainable using less chemical um, and making uh, the management areas of our farm, you know, in the precision ag way, a very, very small area that we manage. Um, coming up to the next year, I'm changing how I'm farming quite a few of my fields. I'm doing multiple practices on one field because I did some whole field trials where I was able to monitor it. Um, look at it in farm beats, see where the uh, plant health look like and then combine that with the yield information and notice well this one farming practice on my field worked great in certain soil types and fell flat on its face in others so I'm going to do two different management techniques on that field to be able to kind of manage the field to the different sections that that matter so on my higher clay soil I'm going to be no-tilling in my legumes and in my lower richer soil I'm still going to have to be doing some tillage to manage my uh, some weed issues because otherwise if I don't the weeds took over all of my crop and uh, and then I just have an issue I have to work through year year after year so I think that's really one of the, the big takeaways with a lot of this technology is being able to combine them together uh, you know if you can use a platform to do that that's even better, but combining that information together to make insights uh, within the current crop season so you don't have to wait year after year to apply some you know, new practice to actually realize the benefits of it. Thank you, Andrew. Any other panelists want to comment on low-hanging fruit? I'll just uh, chime in there. I agree with Andrew. I think one of the challenges the technology is, has been turning sensor-based information into knowledge. In other words, what you do. And that's been for the 20 some years I mentioned I've been involved in, in this uh, goal of integrating technology into agriculture. That's been the challenge. But yet I see the progress happening here as we look at multiple technology, UAVs, so uh, ability to come multiple times and look at that field see the disease development, make a call uh, on when to spray that field. We're making progress in that area. And I do think in the next five years, it's gonna be that integration and uh, return of knowledge of what to do for that uh, grower that's gonna make the biggest uh, progress here. So, so Andrew, um, it's, this is really cool. Um, in the application of these, you know, these technologies and the integration of these technologies, do you actually have a handle on, on the economics of this? I mean, because that's obviously going to be one of the big challenges of using these technologies and integrating these technologies. So 
where right now do you see is the best use of these technologies in say in your farming practice you know, in terms of the actual economics and return on that investment that you've made yeah i see really the the biggest economic gain is the realization of cost savings with respect to reduced chemical usage so um, if you're able to see where the weeds are and spray only where they are, um, unless you're chemical, you need a residual, which you still have to spray across the whole field. But um, a lot of my most expensive chemicals don't have residuals. Um, and that's where I've realized the largest savings. And I'm even, uh, now that I'm multiple years into this and have mapping data over it, even with some of my residual chemicals, I do pre-emerge applications. I'm able to look at historical drone images and draw out where I should be putting which chemicals on the field in a much more precise way than just trying to go by memory of, yeah, this draw had an issue or this field on the southwest corner, there is an issue. I can look and draw it out and then, you know, apply the correct chemicals there. So I think that's really the biggest uh, gains. And for me, it was pretty significant, uh, especially last year. This year we got a lot of rain, so some of my weeds were a little more thick because there was just so much moisture. But uh, um, this year and last year, um, last year I can say for certain the reason I had profit was because I was able to selectively apply some of my chemicals and the amount of money I saved on that is nearly exactly the same amount of my profit that year. So um, I think that my ROI was within a year, um, within the first time I sprayed, I paid for that imaging drone. Andrew, are you looking at any of the sea and spray technology that's available or coming up? Yeah, so I'm talking with Augmenta to try some of theirs. I have some neighbors who use the Weed It technology. It, uh, unfortunately, I have to drive too slow <laughs> with that one. So um, working with Augmenta on theirs uh, for seed and, or seed and uh, top dress and seed and uh, spray when we're doing any burn downs. Uh, my only issue with those is, you know, you mix up a 1,200 gallon tank and then you go out and you spray and you don't know if that's going to cover 120 acres or mm -hmm. 2000 acres. And that's my main issue with the sea and spray is you need to know, have an estimate of how much you're actually needing to load. Cause otherwise I have all that excess chemical right. and, you know, mixed chemical that I have to try to store and save till next time. And sometimes it falls out and I'm not able to save it. Interesting. Great, thank you all. Um, next question I have here, uh, if you would start us off, Ron. Um, what role do you see crop consultants playing in, in this technological future? I mean, will they be the users of this tech? Uh, with the delivery of intelligence systems then to farmers from them? Or, you know, how is this whole information supply route going to change with all this technology? Yeah, that's a good question, Chris. You know, I mentioned uh, the history in this. In the beginning, I know a lot of us thought that uh, we could design the information systems that the local grower could utilize and make sense out of what the sensor was telling him, uh, either in the take case of yield monitoring or aerial imaging. But what we found was that basically you needed to integrate a whole uh, another layer of information into that, and that was some kind of knowledge about you know, plant health and what, what is the disease? What, how you treat that disease? What, what to, to do with that? And so over the years, it's become uh, essential to have that uh, consulting uh, network or team that working with growers in many of these uh, farming situations. In fact, I think it's maybe even more important as time goes on to develop a technology team that it allows you to take advantage of the multiple information and, uh, and put it into use, like I said, turn it into knowledge uh, uh, there. So I, I, the future, I think, for ag consulting and, and uh, networking and technologies is very bright. I think this is exactly the way it's going to head and more assistance needed in, in uh, 
integrating and, and using these technologies in agriculture. Yeah, let me, maybe, maybe I can add on to that. Thanks, Ron. Uh, you know, I think Chris and Ron, agriculture is a relationship business and that's, I don't see that changing in the future. I think it will shift a bit. Um, and I think that the crop consultants need to make sure they up their game on, uh, on technology, being tech, technologically savvy. Not that they aren't, uh, some of them aren't already, but uh, on average, I think they're, we need to do a little bit of upskilling on technology. Um, but it, no doubt the, um, the way that farmers get their information will be multi-channel, right? It'll be online, digital, but it'll also come through uh, the crop consultants as well. And I, I think that technology really has the opportunity, gives the crop consultant an opportunity to reduce their cost to serve on kind of the, the, the easy stuff and focus more on the, on the more complicated challenges that the growers face. Um, so I, I see that will be a, a shift for sure. There'll be a shift in the role, but it, uh, it's definitely gonna remain an important role in the future. Yeah, Doug, that's exactly right. I haven't had an association with the uh, Crop Consultants Association of America. Why I, I know they have really focused in on trying to get training and the knowledge base and sensing technologies, and I'll just use the word precision technologies here. And uh, I think that's exactly, they, they have to really be the knowledge person if they're going to fill that role. They have to have that expertise. But it is a team. It, it's not just the consultant here. It's going to be industry and consultant and, and application-based uh, deliveries, uh, whether uh, smartphone delivery, whatever uh, information type of delivery. They're going to all have to come together to make this work. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. Well, thank you. I don't know if the moderator gets to interject or not here, but I guess since I'm the moderator, I will. I'll just say that, you know, I've spent a lot of my work in the last couple of years creating decision support tools. And we've had several growers tell us when we've tried to do this, we like, how do you like the software design? How does this look for you? And they're like, well, don't ask me, ask my crop consultant. This is going to be their problem. And yeah. so I think it's, uh, um, uh, this is a great segue into the next question here uh, for you, Doug, and, and that's, you know, um, we really value industry's perspective on what we need to be doing to, to educate this next generation of ag professionals now. I'm interested in, in your view and others' view on, on what do we need to change about the ag curriculum to, to get them ready. Yeah, thank you for that question. You know, I remember uh, the commencement speech at, when I graduated from the University of Illinois, the, the um, there was the speaker mentioned that the uh, there was an Englishman Thomas Young I believe that was like the last man to know everything, and I found that fascinating. And, and the speaker went on to say that you know universities will need to uh, they won't be able to teach people everything on a subject. They'll have to help people learn how to get information and get insights from that information. And I think you know where would we be without Google today? You know I I, I don't think there's a day that goes by without Google. So I've I've mastered that, I think, and I'm amazed sometimes at what comes back in some of my searches. But um, we have created a world of specialists, right? When you think about the software engineers, you think about data architects, data scientists, um, there's just so much information uh, that one person can't know it all, even in just uh, in, in raising crops, right? So, you know, now you add in machine learning and artificial intelligence, uh, specialists in precision ag, decision ag, uh, pathology, uh, even pathologists that focus on a single crop and disease, right? To, we're, we're getting to that point now, especially. And, and I have to ask myself, you know, we've created all these specialists, but who's going to connect all the dots? You know, where, where did the idea of the generalist go? Um, so, so there's no doubt there's going to be a need for this, these specialty areas, but there's also going to be a need for somebody that can put it all together and understand the impacts of some of the solutions on, you know, phyto, you know, like you have to look at the whole picture, right? The nutrients, uh, the soil, insects, phytotoxins, who's looking at all this stuff and, and plugging it all together. So I think to me, that is going to be an important role in the future is that generalist that can pull it together. Um, and, and of course, artificial intelligence, we're going to have to rely more and more on artificial intelligence because we just can't cram any more information into our brains. And, uh, you know, I think as, you know, I think I, I saw Elon Musk talk about people will start using autonomous vehicles when they, 
have fewer accidents than humans, right? And so when, when that trust level goes up, and I think it's the same thing with, with growing crops, right? When artificial intelligence is actually making better decisions than, than we can as humans in some cases, that's when people will start to really adopt it. So uh, there's definitely a role in AI in the future. Others? Great, thank you, Doug. Yes, anyone else? Well, I just really important points, you know, I mean, I kind of grew up in the world of agriculture and biology, et cetera, but it's very clear that as we move forward, there has to be this integration, not just of the different technologies, but of our culture. And I think this is something that NC State and other universities now are getting much more in tune with. In fact, this cross training at uh, either the undergraduate or the graduate level, and that can obviously extend to, to other ag professionals because yeah, no one person can know everything, but I can read with Doug that, you know, you have to have that ability to have a kind of a, a view of the big picture in order to be successful in this next generation. I mean, you know, what is the training that is now required for an ag professional for the next uh, decade or so? I think these are very important questions that, that universities need to be addressing. Obviously, with input from from Andrew and Doug and other people out there, you know, and the you know, and our participants here, I wonder what your feelings are on this in terms of what do these people need to know? What does your ad consultant need to know to be successful to help you? Well, I think for for me, um, I like. Ha having everyone have a more holistic view. And that's how I actually hire most of my younger employees on the farm. Um, I try to get them exposure into multiple different areas. So that way they can, I think that's the best way for them to come up with new ways to do things is by being having access to all of those. And um, for, for me and my farm and for our area, I work with I start with high schoolers and when they come out to the farm, I show them what we're doing. And uh, every year I usually have at least one high schooler that I hire and works with us. And I'm, and even into college, a lot of them will work with us. And I, you know, I'm trying now to show them that farming isn't just a pigeonhole sort of uh, career, that it's one where you can uh, take a holistic view and then you can do a specialization in one area, but if they have that better overall view of the farm and how people are able to uh, utilize different technologies or, or different practices, um, I think that's what can excite them. So I have one that really is excited about um, using, uh, doing drone flights and finding uh, you know, weeds or disease areas with it. And I have another one that's very excited about um, finding the most efficient way to work a field. We have, we have very hilly fields. So that's actually a pretty difficult thing in my area. I guess that wouldn't matter as much in the Midwest, but, uh, um, but, you know, that's kind of how I'm trying to approach it. And I always, and I, I bring out our local FFA at least once a year uh, to see have them see the new things that we're doing here and kind of get their thoughts on it, see what they think is interesting and fun. And, and that's really the, the way to hook and, and get them more excited about it. Thank you. All right. Um, I want a question that's kind of the opposite where we started. Let's, uh, we've covered the low hanging fruit. Ralph, I wonder if you could talk to us about um, you know, what's coming in the longer term? What is the most transformative sensing technology you see coming in something like the next 20 years? We got you muted, Ralph, sorry. Well, Chris, I mean, this is kind of one of the holy grails, right? I mean, what is this new sensing technology that's going to revolutionize uh, uh, agriculture? I mean, it's, it's kind of, uh, it's unknown in many respects. I mean, we see you know, the, the rapid uh, development and uh, utilization of, of sort of um, off the shelf technology. So what, where are we going with this? Well, I'm, I'm a firm believer that the plant will tell you everything. 
if you can get inside the head of that plant, so to speak, you are going to have a pretty good idea about what is going on in, in for, for, for ag production. And so again, as a, you know, I, I firmly believe that what we're going to finish up is, with is maybe 20 years is too far down the road, but we're going to have, I think, self-reporting plants. We're going to have plants that are going to be able to tell you what ails them, what their problems are, and using that information, we can hopefully intervene um, to be able to solve that problem. I mean, this goes back to this whole notion that uh, I talked about, about the fact that plants do talk. They do have a language. They have words. Those words are metabolites. We can detect those different chemicals various different ways. We use drones. We use aerial imaging. Okay, to, to actually look at the spectral changes, but we're looking at spectral changes in molecules. We can detect other biochemical pathways through various molecular approaches. But ultimately, what we're looking at is we're looking at the metabolism of the plant, the physiology, okay, and we understand a lot about the physiology as it relates to crop production. So it goes back to this notion, how are we can how can we detect how can we get plants to self-monitor? I think we're getting closer. To be able to, I mean, we already have technologies that can actually be applied to uh, plant surfaces that can be integrated. They aren't currently genetically into that plant, but they actually can be applied on the surface. And the plants can then monitor them. Can, we can, re can recover that information of how the plant is, is responding to, you know, either electrophysiological signals, different chemical signals that are coming back from plants. So what do we need to be able to do some of these things? Well, I mean, we're getting close. So one thing is you need battery power, you need power. All these things require power to be generated. And with technology, we're getting to the point now where plants can almost produce, well, they do, they produce electricity, they have electrical signals, they have action potentials. So we can, we're getting to the point where plants can be batteries. And so if they're batteries, therefore they can accumulate information and they can relay that information about their fundamental metabolism to self-report. So is that within 20 years? I don't know, we're getting there. But there's all these hurdles we have to think about. We have to think about sustainability. We have to think about safety. We have to think about consumption. All these other, all these other components that are important uh, that we're going to be able to, to have to deal with in order that these things uh, could be could be acceptable. But I think it's not science fiction that within 20 years we will have self-reporting plant systems that can actually tell us what's going on in the field in the field situation, and that's really exciting because you know even with a drone, you know, or any other kind of imaging technology, being able to get information on the scale that we're going to need to, and, and, and the depth of information. I'm not sure that that's going to be that easy. And again, the level of granulation and, and complexity of that information, unless you're getting it, the plants themselves reporting, maybe not every plant, but a plant every wherever in a, in a field can give us a lot of information about drought tolerance, stress, even potentially the type of pathogen that's being infected. I mean, the sensors that, that, that I'm working with, with folks in, in engineering, these sensors detect the different volatiles. We all know that plants produce aromas, okay? And, and these volatile compounds are produced for a variety of reasons. One of the most important reasons that, that plants produce these volatiles is, is to activate defense mechanisms, either in themselves or to warn neighboring plants, either to, in, to, to activate their defenses. So again, by eavesdropping on these type of signals, either remotely by having these type of sensor technologies that can detect these changes in aromatic compounds, gives us an opportunity from very far distance away that there's a problem in a particular locality that hopefully then that early warning system, that decision support system that you talked about, Chris, we can, we can incorporate that into those type of uh, of operations. Now, this is down the road. If we're looking in our crystal ball, this is where I think we're going to be going. So that's just kind of like the science fiction view, but it's close to reality. This is getting close to reality, not too far away. 
Thanks, right. Ralph. I just love that language. Eavesdropping on plant <laughs> on plant language. That's that's lovely. Anybody else want to comment on 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 to this longer term uh, yeah. future? Well, yeah, I, I just wanted to ask another kind of a question. I think it's fascinating, Ralph, and I, I am it's just amazing to think of the possibilities here. But I also wonder if there's other types of sensing technology that we may see evolve over the next you know, five to 10 years around sustainability. You mentioned sustainability. But, you know, we know in Europe it's, uh, it's uh, even a bigger issue uh, for um, what can and can't be applied. Um, and dosages and so forth. But that's coming, you know, as we have the technology to be able to do something about it in, in the US, then um, I would see that we will get some, some additional uh, restrictions potentially and um, different, different characteristics that we have to, uh, to monitor. And I just wonder if there's sensors that you see that could potentially monitor water, water quality, uh, you know, residual levels, other, other types of sensors or uh, just maybe you could just comment on what else you might see coming. Well, uh, you know, if you look at the literature and the literature is, at, is just growing exponentially in the types of different sensor technologies that folks are using. And some of these sensor technologies already exist. And I'm sure, Chris, in, in some of the monitoring systems that you've set up, you already have soil moisture sensors, et cetera, et cetera. And so the question is, what scale, what scope? Uh, what granularity, how do you get that information from these different types of sensors? So I think some of those, that, that information is already available. And so I think, uh, I think the, the impediment there is, not, I don't think is the sensor. I think it's as much as how do we collect that information in real time, which becomes the computer science, the engineering issues. So I think that's all very good news. And I see that within five years. And, and Chris, maybe you want to comment on, on, on that further. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 you know, maintaining an on-farm trial network with the multiple types of sensors out there, I would say it's astronomical what's been accomplished just in the, within the last five years, you know. These were ideas we were discussing. If we'd had this panel five years ago, we'd be like, oh, well, this will be, it's all here now, right? We have, I have across many, many states a constant stream of data uh, for multiple sensor types. And so, um, you know, I think that is just going to continue to grow. Um, I, I think that feeds into another thing, and I'd be interested in Andrew's experience with this. Um, having done this ourselves is that those hurdles for the first few years were actually very pragmatic problems, like, oh, this particular spider keeps, keeps corrupting my printed circuit board, or, you know, how, what has your experience been like on that very nuts and bolts level of maintaining these sensor networks across, across a working farm? It, it, it has been a learning curve. <laughs> Just a few days ago, I was commenting about how it's so smoky over here, I could only see a, like 100 yards. And we were harvesting a field. Um, one of my other combines was cutting uh, ahead of me. And I said, hey, that next pass, you're going to be really close, if not at my sensor. And it was, it was dusty, there was no wind, and the smoke was so, I mean, it was two o'clock in the afternoon, we had our lights on, it was just so dim. Um, well, the combine ate the sensor, so <laughs> long story short. But uh, so now I have a long, I purchased long uh, flags, like they use those fiberglass flags for uh, um, dune buggies. And those are going to be mounted to all my sensor stations from now on that, that are in field. But really, I feel like the benefit of having them in field outweighs the risk of, of at one point, somebody, uh, really, they just wrecked the stand was all that happened. But, uh, um, you know, so, but having it in field gives me so many more advantages. I'm willing to deal with that. And uh, a lot of these things are going to be a little different from area to area because in my area, our rainfall, uh, you know, I don't irrigate. So the rainfall is what it is and that affects a lot my crop height. So where somebody hit this sensor, I was anticipating my club wheat that I planted to get to about two and a half feet tall. Well, it was about three and a half to four feet tall there. So it, it just kind of hit it too well. <laughs> um, 
but then a lot of the other practical things is I'm starting to look more at sensing technologies that have less moving parts. Because when you have a bunch of these sensors spread all out, I'm having to go around to check on them. And that's taking a lot of time. Now it takes me a full day um, every month or two to go out and check all my sensor stations. And then, you know, sometimes I'll have a battery or a charge controller fail. Thankfully, I can see that on my computer and then just go and fix that one. Um, but there's a lot of practical things like that. So I'm, I'm looking more towards uh, less moving part sensors or uh, different sensors like the one that uh, use a stress cramp the stress cam, Chris, I'm liking the idea of moving those and having those in more fields. Eventually that would be my goal is I would have a, some sort of small camera that's literally just on the plant monitoring it. And it'd be kind of a representative plant, representative area for the field. And if there's an issue that will tell me I need to go do a drone flight, see if it's a bigger thing, or I need to go to this field. That way I'm not wasting as much time going around to every field. And I'm still catching things earlier than we do now because we do, you know, monitor, but it's on a, you know, weekly basis. Well, you know, sometimes we get rust fungus that comes through our area and that can roar through really fast and we're pretty vigilant about it, but still is one thing where there's a field that takes, you know, 45, 50 minutes and it's down a, a rough dirt road, you know, utilizing technology to make sure you can monitor that like the field that's right across my house, um, I think is going to make farming better, you know, for the whole farm. So that way you're managing your whole farm better. Yeah, Chris, if I could uh, chime in here. I just want to circle back to what Doug and, and actually Ralph said as well. And that is, uh, how are we going to utilize what we've got better today? You know, what's in, the, what's in store for monitoring the environment as well as the plant? For instance, right now we're using water, uh, soil moisture sensors that are able to tell us how deep the root system is, what, what volume we have. Then we're also monitoring canopy temperature, leaf temperature. So we can tell, indeed, is that level of soil moisture, is that rooting depth adequate to maintain canopy temperature in the field? It's going to, it's going to be, I think, integrating sensors together in a, in a way that gives you a holistic picture of not just the environment, but also what the plant is doing in that environment that's going to help us uh, be better uh, uh, able to use nutrients, water, and, and light. I also rouse the guy after my own heart here. You know, I've all, often said that we're like treating, uh, tending a baby right now, you know? It cries, we don't know why. So you're trying, oh, is the diaper wet? Does it need to be? Whatever it is. In the future, <laughs> if the baby can get to six years old and tell us, oh, I got a tummy ache, why then we can skip a bunch of these, these extraneous uh, information and get right to the point there. So I, I think the future is, uh, I, I like what Ralph says. I love that kind of future. And as I said, I don't think we're that far off. We understand an awful lot of the biochemistry and physiology of plant and plant stress. It's just our ability to eavesdrop, uh, as, as Chris mentioned, that is our, our challenge. And so this is where I think different technologies will come to bear. I mean, we talked about, we talked about detecting volatile compounds because that's a clear, clear indicator of what type of stress plants are going under. But there's other types of markers too. We can look at electrochemical signals. You know, as I said earlier, I mean, plants do produce action potentials, electrical potentials. And that can then give us some indication of stress, whether it relates to water stress or other types of abiotic stress. And so again, it's going to come back to how all these different sensors can be integrated. So yes, it's important that we have sensors in the environment, but I think it's equally important that we have sensors that are inside plants. And it goes back to what Ron was saying, you know, the crying, screaming baby. You know, that's where I think the future lies, um, if we can get to that point. And I, and I, think, I think there's a lot of interest in this area, a lot of research interest in this area. And I think there is the, there is the potential that we can get there uh, within within the foreseeable future. 
All right, well, thank you. Um, we're, we're going to be jumping soon to uh, only questions from the audience, but um, but I want to I want to go ahead and grab one right now because it just seems particularly relevant to some of the discussion. And that is is what are the entry barriers to this technology in the here and now for growers? I mean, and and is there a scale effect here? I mean, is this the type of technology because there's a learning curve that we only our large growers can be looking and engaging in, or do we see an opportunity for small growers to get on board with this as, as well right now? Well, I'll I'll hop in there on that one because uh, you know I I use a bunch of IoT devices. I think they're great a great scalable. Uh, way and something that small and large producers can use. Um, there is a little bit of a learning curve depending on uh, what one you're installing and and you know what company you're working with and uh, how you get it going. But really, I think that uh, most farmers, you know, work on their own equipment, which is getting very, uh, very much technical anymore, and can really have the skills to put most of this stuff up. And the nice thing with IoT devices is you have them scattered on among your fields or maybe just the field closest to your shop or something like that. Well, that's, that's something that is scalable because even a small farmer, I was just talking to one of my neighbors, he only farm, he farms uh, 300 acres. Um, he does a lot of other things, turkeys and, uh, and some livestock, other livestock and and then some dry land farming, he's even able to use some, wanting to use some of these IoT devices to better monitor two parts of his field. And that's really, you know, he's gonna be able to more micromanage his field and eke out all the yield that he can and keep his field as sustainable as possible in the process. I, I'll just provide a comment too that um, I've been working with some robotics teams more recently and you know what strikes me is most of the robotic solutions that folks are really looking at right now are much smaller than the ag equipment i mean that i think that's the the, the early robotics you know 10 years ago people were they were actually replicating what we were doing on the farm at the same scale and then just saying okay but now people have really started to imagine now that i don't have a driver does it make sense for everything to continue getting larger and larger when they say no really actually i want to scale it down here and so we could be looking at you know, I mean, if you think about the technology we have in agriculture today, it is not scale neutral. A combine and a planter are not scale neutral technologies by a long shot. But some of these technologies could be far more scale neutral, I'd say. Yeah, I agree with that entirely, Chris. I think, I think the future is smaller and smaller. Robotics, uh, uh, artificial intelligence, uh, even micro uh, nano creatures that they're able to to affect the plant uh, in the future, I think are, are where we need to think about. Uh, we don't need the big tractor and 40 foot uh, disc behind it and stuff like that to, to really make uh, information and turn it into uh, action there. I also mentioned, uh, like what Andrew said, I agree. I think the biggest barrier is, is knowledge, you know, learning about these things and knowing which one to select and how to get started. I think it's just a matter of finding um, out what you need and, and you can find a price point. I worked with uh, some small universities over the years where we even looked at uh, some of the used technologies that, that a small grower can get started in that makes a lot of sense there. It might be outdated uh, in the real time, but for them, it was a good place to start learning about and working into, uh, get their foot in the door into something that uh, they can get into the future. One thing I want to say about that smaller equipment, I, I very much agree with it. There's currently a company uh, called Savanto Ag that's uh, using small Kubota tractors to autonomously plant fields. Uh, they only do a couple rows at a time. And uh, with my spray drone, if I got six of them, it would be just as efficient as my 120 foot Patriot sprayer, but it would cost me um, less than a quarter of the price. And as I grow and shrink my acres, 
I can add or remove one of those spray drones and it's not nearly of a difference as, you know, getting a whole new sprayer. That was one of the problems I, I grew and I actually am wanting to shrink back just a touch because I grew to this awkward point where I kind of needed to get another really expensive piece of machinery and that just doesn't make sense for a farmer. But if you can have these smaller scalable solutions, you know, oh, well, you're adding one small spray drone, which cover, you know, which is enough for, you know, 800 acres or something, 500 acres. Uh, that's well, much better than uh, a big sprayer, which basically goes in 8,000 acre increments. Great, thank you. Um, Another one that just popped up here that I think is a good one that we haven't touched on here today is, is if we have sensors collecting this much information from farms, uh, what do we see as the security risks for farmers? To what level is all this information about their fields uh, uh, provide an economic threat to their livelihood? Yeah, it's a tough one. Um... I mean, clearly, it's it's a risk that we we need to be sensitive to, um, you know, because you you know, even not just from a risk of loss of your data to to other parties, but um, you know, potential change of changing of data, right? That would actually indicate a different prescription potentially. Um, not sure why somebody might want to do that, but that is is definitely a risk to to be considered. Yeah, I agree. I mean, the ancient Assyrians, they, they affected Israel by sowing salt on the land and poisoning the, the land so it wouldn't be productive. And certainly um, these kind of systems could be used nefariously like that um, uh, in, against us. I saw the movie Interstellar where all the combines come to the house. I, I, you know, I hope we're... <laughs> I hope that's just fantasy, but we, I do think this is a serious question and that we really have to think about how to protect data. Data is, is valuable. It is valuable today and we need to know how to protect that uh, so that we know we got the right data, the data that's correct for that system and uh, we got ways of securing it. Yeah, I know just personally, you know, this was something when we started doing our continuous data, we were not as careful with it as we are now. Everything that we collect is, is locked down tight, but um, it really came from one of our growers. One of our growers mentioned that, you know, I, I had the yield off of this one field that we had our experiments running and uh, they didn't want their landlord to find out how well that was yielding. And that was the first time I was yeah. like, oh, yeah, okay, I can see that. Rents tend to go up <laughs> when landlords know you're sitting on a quality piece of land, so. Mm -hmm. That, that also introduces the question about who owns the data, right? Whether it's the grower, the landowner, or, yeah. It's a whole nother topic. Absolutely. Um, all right, sorry, I'm trying to sift through some more of these questions we've got coming in here. They're coming in fast in different windows now. So, uh, Michelle, do you want to cue one? I think I just lost the one I was getting ready to read. Somehow it switched categories here. Absolutely. Uh, so we have one from Alex Martin. Uh, I work at a company doing online ag machinery loans. I know that the next thing is incorporating remote sensing data in our credit underwriting process. If you were a lender, which data sources and indicators do you hypothesize would be most important? Interesting because uh... Farm Beats is you. We've used it uh, some in Africa for something similar. Um, being able to sense that uh, farmers are are doing what they said uh, for operating loans. Um, my thought is, um, you know, for equipment loan, <laughs> I'm just. I'm just trying to think, you know, as long as it's used in the correct way, um, I think that would be a, a little bit of a different type of sensing um, to make sense there. Um, but, you know, if you're talking about equipment loan for irrigation pivot, then, you know, a sensing of how much 
irrigation is going to be done is going to make more sense. So I guess that kind of depends on the type of equipment that's, that you're working with. I don't think there could be one generic uh, set of sensors that, that would work across all. Andrew, let me just uh, add, add to a question for you. Um, what about sensors on the equipment itself, such as wind and temperature, et cetera, that could potentially even regulate, you know, uh, what's applied in buffer zones and so forth? Mm -hmm. Would that yeah, be something I, you would see important to, to uh, consider for machinery yeah, and equipment loans? That and, and actually uh, a sensor on the outside in terms of sound, because you can tell a lot from the sound of a machine. Mm -hmm. um, I think that would uh, be very important too, because then you know duration of applications, you know uh, engine speeds, you know, uh, you can even sometimes figure out, you know, the actual vehicle speed from stuff like that. So mm -hmm. um, it, it goes into that gray area of, of uh, the privacy thing though, because, right. you know, how much can you, uh, can you listen in on what the farmer is doing? We have another question it's from Kelly Chapman. It says, most of your comments so far are discussing positive, um, art, I'm sorry, so most of your comments are discussing, ugh, most of your comments that you are discussing are positive. So why aren't more farms already using them? And what is the average adoption time or curve? Sounds like an Andrew question. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I try not to be a negative person, so maybe that's part of my problem here. <laughs> and uh, that, and I'm, I'm a little stubborn, so if I get an idea, I usually don't drop it until I get it done. But uh, um, honestly, that might be some of the reason why I get more of them implemented on my farm. But, uh, you know, it isn't all easy, and you definitely have to try, you know, you have to have the mindset that this is going to the long-term mindset that this is going to help my farm in the future because um, some of these things aren't helping it immediately when i put up my first couple weather stations they didn't help me immediately but then i was able to apply um, one of our ai machine learning um, algorithms on uh, temperature prediction in microclimate areas and then it became very useful but it had to gather all that data to figure it out first and I think that's really the hardest thing to, for most farmers is that longer term outlook of, of well, I'm going to have to invest this time. And sometimes it's not even that expensive. A lot of these, you know, sensors, you can get cheaper versions of a lot of the sensors, but it's really the time investment to figure out how to do it, and where to put it. And then the long term of, okay, now I have this data, now I can utilize it more effectively. Um, you know, and I, I think that is a big hurdle and I know that's a big hurdle with a lot of my neighbors. Um, they kind of have the, the benefit of being right near me. So a lot of them will stop by when I'm doing something on one of my fields, but, uh, um, yeah, that is, it is a, a issue with it. And then there's a lot of those practical things, getting ac internet access to your different fields, um, you know, being able to connect with Laura and not having to be a uh, engineer to put some of these systems together. I'll bounce over to you, Ron, a second, a follow up here. I mean, you work with a lot of growers that are starting to use these systems now, um, but can you think you could categorize which types of farmers are, are the earlier doctors and, what, what, and what's making them successful? Well, and I agree with Andrew, by the way, it's, it's return on investment. <laughs> that's what growers are. And I think it's a grower who has a longer vision that of uh, these technologies that is probably the early are the ones that are most uh, uh, satisfied with the early adoption of some of these. I've worked with growers who've gotten in grid sampling and then they got into soil conductance and, and some of these things. And yeah, in the beginning, uh, it, it, it was hard to find the return on investment, but as they put some of these pieces together and started looking at the long term, why they identified this uh, parcel of ground that needed uh, 
a different way of uh, managing it, need better drainage, whatever uh, the issue was. Uh, it is difficult sometimes for a grower who's focused on immediate return on investment to get excited about uh, uh, new technologies. It's got to be somebody who looks a little farther and says, I'm going to start this investment and I'm going to work toward making that payoff. I like what Andrew is talking about integrating the weather data into ideas about how to manage microclimates or looking for different uh, climates that are dan a danger to the crop. Once you got that information, then you can start really building an ROI. So I think the early adopters were guys who had a longer vision of where they wanted to go. Thank you. And I don't want to, I don't want to sound stereotypical here. Um, but I, the farmers that I'm working with, I certainly uh, I found it's oftentimes driven by a younger member of the family who's just excited about it. You know, it's just a passion project. Uh, and, you know, I, I don't think it's uh, us old folks like myself can't learn these new things. We just don't have as much time on our hands. And so, you know, you have a young member of the farm family that's really engaged and then that gets them out front in a hurry. Yeah, it's that longer vision. They're taking long term. I'm done, you know, I'm old. It's over. Well, one of our farmers actually said to this, and I had not thought about this context, but he said he was so grateful that this technology had come along because one of his sons, he's like, there's no way he would have been interested in coming back and working on the farm. But this, the whole UAVs and robotics have got him interested in coming back. And so it's, it's uh, uh, we at the university got to make sure to do a better job of tapping into that energy. Um, I want to change gears here a second now and bounce something over that uh, uh, Ralph and, and Doug might could comment on, and that's thinking about GM technology for plant health monitoring. And um, is there a way that, you know, sensors plus GM can, you know, uh, I'm going to have to think about the logic there, but there must, I, I think I can see the logic in there. Is there a way that that combination could be a, a sentinel system for us in agriculture? Hmm. Ralph? Well, well, Chris, I think you mentioned the word right there, are sentinel systems. Mm -hmm. I think that one of the things that you can do with GM is, is create sentinel systems, um, you know, in various different environments. Uh, you know, they, they can be more static, et cetera, but they can report on what's happening in, a, in an environment. Again, it just comes down to the logistics of being able to develop these sentinel systems um, you know, again, it goes back to this whole notion of, of whether we can actually get plants to be self-reporting. And so, yeah, I mean, what what currently is done is you can use plants as biosensors, for example, and they can do that with, with or without GM. So you can have different molecular markers, okay, that you can actually actually identify from, from, from satellite imagery or from drone imagery of how an individual plant is responding. So I think you can use GM in a, in a variety of different ways. Now, is that the best application for it in a, as a sentinel system in a, in a field? I, I don't know. You might be able to maybe more in storage environments might be, might be better to use different types of sentinel technologies to detect different toxins that may be present in a particular food stock or environment. Um, but yes, I mean, it's definitely possible and it's definitely doable and it's done, it's done, but is it really deployable um, currently um, is, I guess, one of the big questions. Doug, maybe this is something that you will think about. Um, some, but I think you, you've kind of covered the points that I was going to suggest and, and, you know, obviously there's a long lead time on making modifications from a GM perspective. So, uh, but maybe in that 20 year range. Yeah, I mean, it does take time to do it. How dynamic is it? Um, I, I don't know. I think we're, you know, we're at the point, we're getting close to the point where we can monitor plants without necessarily the need to yeah. genetically modify them. Right. I mean, there, you know, there are some interesting strategies out there about how can we use um, biological systems, other biological systems to monitor plant health. So other things that are in an environment, different, different, uh, different microbes, different insects, etc., that we can actually monitor in a particular environment to give us some indication of, of plant health. And those are not unrealistic. And there is, you know, DARPA projects that are funding this type of research. Uh, there's a 
project here at NC State called uh, Insect Allies, which is pretty much along those lines, which is a very exciting concept. I mean, it's again, you know, it's a 20 year kind of horizon thing about how, how you can actually use, you know, insects to, to actually manipulate and monitor plant health. So, yeah, but it's down the road, that's for sure. interesting to think about whether that would give us right, some of the controversy around uh, that actually being the harvested part. I mean, could the sentinel plants not be harvested and you in fact have a, you know, a, a separate uh, sentinel out there from them? I mean, I think that's one of the questions. I mean, again, it's like Andrew was talking about his sense of getting, getting, getting combined, you know, it's the same, going to be the same issue. Uh, how do you <laughs> deal with all of that? No matter, you know, what the distribution the matter is, how inexpensive they are. Some of these sensors are, are relatively inexpensive. They use standard uh, microelectronics to manufacture and they're cheap. Uh, but again, it's again, the question is going to be how are you going to keep some of those type of sensors out of the food chain? You know, they could easily get harvested. So how do you do all that? Now, some environments, say in orchards or greenhouses, uh, maybe it's much more manageable than, than environments such as open fields. So there's different technologies for different environments. And so I don't think there's going to be, again, one size fits all. My hope is we get a specific chemical to spray on it. You could kill your uh, sentinel plants easily and they just go out of the way and then you harvest above it. <laughs> you know, Can that, you make that for me? <laughs> that's, that's not a bad idea and it is possible. That is possible. You know, you can have, you know, plants, you can have lethal genes that are certain developmental state of the plant, they die. Mm -hmm. So it's, that's not an impossibility. I have, you know, that's a good idea, actually. All right, I'm going to switch gears again here. I see a, a question here from Gary Roberson here at NC State. So uh, seeing as how he, I owe him many favors by now in life, I better ask his question. <laughs> Uh, so this is, uh, he says for you, Andrew, you made a comparison between large sprayer and multiple drone sprayers. Um, I, he says, I can see that for selective spraying. How does that compare where whole field or near whole field spraying is required? Yeah, so um, the comparison that I see is uh, for the model that I happen to have is six to eight drone sprayers could do the same as my one. I, uh, I'm getting ready to apply to do a, a swarm spraying for next year. One of the things that makes it hard for ag tech, you have to go through all these regulatory hurdles. I have the software that can do it, but I can't legally fly too with my one remote. <laughs> um, but uh, I sprayed a whole 18 acre field exclusively with it, with the one sprayer this year, and it actually did a great job, um, made it much easier harvest. And I was actually able to apply something that I didn't apply on other fields because uh, I didn't want to pay a plane to spray it because that was too expensive. And um, anyways, I was able to hit the plant at the right stage to give myself a big yield boost off of fungicide application. So um, I had a control field that was right next to it that was uh, sprayed the normal way. And then my 18 acres I did all with my uh, drone sprayer. And uh, this year, my uh, other field did 108, no, 121 bushels an acre. And uh, my field that I did the 18 acres on did 130 bushels an acre. Um, usually, they yield exactly the same. They, they're in the same microclimate and everything. Um, so, you know, being able to eke out some uh, opportunities like that is also very helpful um with those you know drone sprayers and being able to not damage your crop by driving over it um the uh the swarm if it becomes easier to get a permit to be able to fly a swarm i think that's going to make a big difference in terms of that and then there's also some other things such as auto loading them because they don't carry as much of payload um but still the the cost differential is still very advantageous in terms of the, in favor of the drone sprayer. And uh, there was 
when I was loading and unloading it, I broke a propeller and uh, uh, one of the little feet on it accidentally. But those fixes are so much cheaper than my sprayer. So basically, if I go to a Case IH store or John Deere store, if I walk out and that my bill's under a thousand bucks, I'm very excited. Um, these, all these parts that I accidentally broke cost me $60 or $70. Um, and then just the motors to run each propeller are under $100. So a lot of the fixes that would need to be done to this thing are just order of magnitudes cheaper than the fixes I have to do to my large sprayer just because it's just so large and everything needs to be so heavy duty on it. Thanks, Andrew. You know, I, I, uh, this is an aside here. You get late, you have these things late on a Thursday. I'm just going to go on. But, um, you know, growing up here in North Carolina, um, you know, when, I, when we would drive, I was from the mountains, when we would drive out east, I can remember the landscape being um, broken up with hedgerows everywhere. And those hedgerows were really there because uh, farmers already knew that there were little sandy spots and little wet spots that, uh, you know, just weren't very profitable to farm and they were farming with small equipment. And so they drove around all of that stuff and left little hedgerows out there. And that's where uh, everybody would from the mountains would go to hunt their quail. Um, and they're all gone now. And it's really those, you know, it's um, um, uh, just the economic consequence of the 120 foot, you know, size equipment. Well, we, they were in the way. And so I'm really excited about the possibility of all of this new technology dwindling our size and being able to maybe have a little more complexity and habitat out there on our farms now because we can drive around them again once we delete the human being and the, and the you know the 60 foot head or the 120 foot sprayer out there. Um, I want to jump over to some other questions coming in here. Um, uh, nope it just disappeared. Sorry the system is dynamic and it keeps shifting around here. Um, oh my god I just lost it. Oh, here it was, imaging system. So before we have our plant sniffers from, uh, from you, Ralph, uh, are you aware, is anybody aware of where we're using imaging systems uh, to treat crop crust? I mean, we've, we've already heard about auto detection of weeds and weed mapping. Is that, does anybody know of that being done on like fungal or insect pests where we're auto detecting and spraying? Yeah, I can comment on that. So uh, Zarvio, there is a tool, a Zarvio scouting tool that um, some of you may have heard of. Um, that's owned by BSF that uh, is used for weed, uh, weed identification, but also it can uh, leverage leaf damage to uh, uh, pick up disease identification as well. Uh, I think there was another part of that question, right? Oh, um, what about fungal pathogen detection and treatment? I don't know uh, if that's maybe more for Ralph. Uh, but I know, you know, you talked, Ralph, already about the volatile uh, organic compounds uh, being picked up, not necessarily the fung fungus itself, but the response to the fungus, right? Right. But some fungi produce, uh, you know, diagnostic volatiles too. But back to the whole concept of imagery, I mean, it is, this is a very, very active area of research. I think most of us are very well aware of. I mean, so the question is, is, you know, it's so much data that you get from, from um, imaging technologies, um, you know, the optical, different types of optical mapping, et cetera, is the question becomes is how quickly can all that data be processed? Because what you're looking for is you're looking for a particular uh, um, image signature uh, that can be diagnostic for a particular problem. Again, uh, it's, you know, can you, can it be used for, Diagnosing, diagnosing a specific disease at this point in time. I think we would like to get there, but I don't think that's possible. You can certainly, as I think Doug, you talked about, is you can actually use it to, to look for how much of a canopy is being, you know, the, the signature from a different regions of a leaf can give you some idea about what type of pathogen you're dealing with. And so that information is, is, is very useful. And there's, a, there's just, you know, infinite amount of, re of research going on in this particular area because there is the belief that, it, that, that we will get there uh, but it's going to come down to how quickly all that data can be processed and uh, analyzed to get solutions or get, get answers back to, to growers in, in close to real time right because as you know that's the that's the nature of the beast you know you've got to be able to respond quickly here 
That's right. Yeah. Yeah, but you could go back 10 years, there was some nice research done just using infrared uh, imaging. They could detect the uh, potato leaf blight uh, 10 days before you could actually visually see it in the field. The problem, of course, uh, like you mentioned, that, that is it potato leaf blight? Is it something else? Somebody had to go out and, and figure out what, what that uh, image was showing. And then you got timeliness. You know, you, the drone, the UAVs have allowed us to start, start to address that, being able to get imaging more timely on a regular basis to get right, over I, some I, of that. And I think that's very important. What the point you're making, this goes back to Andrew's point, is that you know, if you can identify a region of your field where there's a problem, you're not sure what it is, but then you can send in some sort of secondary um, you know, means of being able to look at that and come up, you know, and then be able to further diagnose what the problem is. And so I don't, again, this comes back to this, what something that you brought up, Ron, is the whole idea about technologies need to be integrated. There is going to be no one technology that answers all these questions. It again comes back to we're going to be integrating different levels of technology that can essentially hone in on a particular problem hopefully in real time so that the urgent matters can be addressed. I mentioned something I saw that was really fun last year um, that they, they rolled out in Europe and that was a smart sprayer and I think that, that could apply to both weed control and these. And it got to your question, Andrew, when you mentioned, well, you know, I don't know how much I'm going to mix up and so then I had extra because of my drone sprayer only needed little spots. They had rigged this so that actually you only loaded onto the sprayer the, the jugs. And so you had each of the jugs of chemistry out there and then it had a water tank and it was mixing on the fly and dynamically choosing what herbicide combination hit every little you know, square meter of soil out there. And so you didn't, when you ended the day, you still had your jugs and you had not over mixed. So, but yeah, I look at, uh, they have that uh, for my sprayer and I keep looking at, at getting it. So right now it's that ROI thing. Because <laughs> it's pretty spendy to put on there. <laughs> it didn't look cheap when I saw it, no. <laughs> Great, well we are, we are within just like five minutes of, of concluding here. So I just wanted to be give all the panelists the opportunity and I'll move on before I move on to other questions. Chris, you kind of cut out there, so you might want to rephrase what you just said. Oh, I'm sorry. I was going to give panelists an opportunity if they had any thoughts, any more parting thoughts before we had to go in five minutes. Otherwise, I can, I got other questions, but I just wanted to give some wrap-up thought that time if folks wanted it. Well, I'm a firm believer in, in these technologies, and I'm a firm believer that it's going to require, you know, different partnerships between stakeholders of different different types, growers, the industry, uh, in addition to universities, to be able to address these. And obviously, folks like Andrew, these early adopters, that are going to be able to move this whole field forward. I mean, there are, you know, yes, we need generalists, but we need to continue to build these teams. And I think that ultimately will lead to improved confidence in these technologies, and confidence will lead to additional adoption. That's kind of how I feel this whole field is going to be moving forward. Yeah, and I'll just uh, maybe say, I, I think it's, it's, you know, this is really fascinating technology. I think it's got some great potential. Um, and Andrew's already recognizing some of the benefits of it. But we, we need to make sure that there's integration in mind, right? So we have a, a whole, it, it comes together in a, in a software solution. So Andrew's not having to learn 15 different tools to, to manage this. I don't know how many you have today, but probably close. Um, you know, how do we integrate all this stuff together? And I think that as, a, as an industry, we can uh, work together to establish standards and other digital resources to allow these systems to all talk to each other and create an integrated uh, solution. So um, the other thing I'll just add, you know, at, until commodity prices recover, I think that, you know, the, the amount of money that farmers have to invest in this technology is going to be tight. And I think that's, uh, you know, once the commodity prices recover, I think growers will have some more room to breathe and um, hopefully we'll see more adoption of technology and, and innovation. 
Yeah, I agree with Doug entirely. It's going to be common interfaces, common uh, icons, you know, how cell phones have, have changed over the years. We're going to have to see the same thing where we can recognize the same thing and these technologies integrate together, talk to each other so that data stream can be uh, uh, utilized in, as a layer in, in a decision process here. Indeed, yes, uh, finding economic resources to move forward, uh, that, that's gonna be difficult for farmers today with the prices and the situation. But I think this is this panel has raised uh, my hopes anyway, <laughs> that, that we got some places to think about we can prepare ourselves knowledge-wise for that next day when we got the chance to jump in. And I think that my parting thoughts are kind of uh, the same way that I think about ag sustainability is the way I think about ag tech is, you know, everyone needs to get a level up. That doesn't mean that everyone needs to be a early adopter like me. But as long as everyone's progressing along the way, I think that's even possible with uh, some of our, um, you know, lower commodity prices that we have right now. And I, I think that's kind of the approach that I took was I took the highest return, like, okay, this needs to pay for itself this year. Um, and did that one thing first. And then, you know, you tick off and it makes it easier to build up. Um, but, and that's kind of how I approach, you know, sustainability among farms is it's better if we can get all farms to get better than to just have the ones that are already at the front get, you know, even further. Well, I'll, I'll just add in uh, my two cents as I'm just excited about it because I think the last couple of years in agronomy have been kind of dull. I mean, I think, uh, you know, for much of my career, we've been sort of fine tuning old ideas and, you know, we've made them a little better, but this is the time when fundamentally new ideas are, are, are out there and I can just see transformational change is really on the horizon. So uh, it's an exciting time to be an agronomist. Um, so I, I want to thank all our panelists. You guys have been spectacular, you made my job just incredibly simple. So I uh, really appreciate you giving your time and expertise here to us today. Um, also, again, want to thank our sponsor and uh, lead in from uh, from Faith here today, um, and uh, the Biotech Center for organizing this excellent series. Uh, I've been enjoying it. The other ones included. So, thank you very much. Um, and then, uh, lastly, you know, Andrew, our uh, us East Coasters, the West Coast is is in our thoughts right now. So, um, thank uh, you. That's come on, okay. Anything else we need, Michelle? I think that's it. I just really want to thank all of you and Chris for doing such an amazing job with moderating this panel. You all made it look very <laughs> comfortable and just like a normal conversation. And I really appreciate it. It was wonderful. And thank you to everybody for attending and we will see you in November. Happy fall. Thank you. Bye. Bye.